The Children of Green No by L. M. Boston, Chapter One. A little boy was sitting in the corner of a railway carriage, looking out at the rain, which was splashing against the windows and blotching downward in an ugly, dirty way. He was not the only person in the carriage, but the others were strangers to him. He was alone, as usual. There were two women opposite him, a fat one and a thin one. And they talked without stopping, smacking their lips in between sentences and seeming to enjoy what they said as much as if it was something to eat. They were knitting all the time. And whenever the train stopped, the click-clack of their needles was loud and clear like two clocks. It was a stopping train, more stop than go, and it had been crawling along through flat, flooded country for a long time. Everywhere there was water. Not sea or rivers or lakes, but just senseless flood water, with the rain splashing into it. Sometimes the railway lines were covered by it, and then the train noise was quite different, softer than a boat. I wish it was the flood, thought the boy, and that I was going to the ark. That would be fun, like the circus. Perhaps Noah had a whip and made all the animals go round and round for exercise. What a noise there would be with the lions roaring, elephants trumpeting, pigs squealing, donkeys braying, horses whinnying, bulls bellowing, and hens always thinking that they were going to be trodden on, but unable to fly up to the roof where all the other birds were singing, screaming, twittering, squawking and cooing. What must it have sounded like coming along on the tide? And did Mrs. Noah just knit? Knit and take no notice. The two women opposite him were getting ready for the next station. They packed up their knitting and collected their parcels and then sat staring at the little boy. He had a thin face and very large eyes. He looked patient and rather sad. They seemed to notice him for the first time. What's your name, son? asked the fat woman suddenly. I've never seen you on the train before. This was always a question he dreaded. Was he to say his unexpected real name or his silly pet names? Tosland, he said. Tosland? Oh, that's a real old-fashioned name in these parts. Oh, there's Then Tosland and Tosland St Agnes and Tosland Gunning. What's your Christian name? That is it. Tosland. Do your mum and dad live round here, son? No, they live in Burma. Fancy that now. That's a long way away, isn't it? Oh, where are you going then? I don't know. Well, that is, I'm going to see my great-grandmother old now at Green Noah. The, set, the station is Penny Soaky. Oh, that's the station after this. Oh, we get out here. Don't forget the next station. And make sure there's some dry land before you get out the train. Oh, the floods are bad there. Bye-bye, cheerio. They got out shouting and joking with the porters and kissing the people who had come to meet them. They started off into the hissing rain as if they loved it. Toslin heard the fat woman's loud voice saying, Oh, I don't mind this. Oh, I like it. It's our home rain. Oh, not like that dirty London water. The train jogged on again and now Tosland was quite alone. He wished he had a family like the other people, brothers and sisters, even if his father were away. His mother was dead. He had a stepmother but he hardly knew her 
and was miserably shy of her. He'd been at boarding school and for the last holidays he'd been left behind to stay with the headmistress, Miss Spud, and her old father. They meant to be kind to him, but they never spoke to him without saying, Dear. It was, finish up your porridge, dear. And we don't want you to get thin. Or, put on your coat, dear. We don't want you to catch cold. Or, get ready for church, dear. Oh, we don't want you to grow up a heathen. And every day after breakfast, run along to your room, dear. We want to read the papers. But now, his great-grandmother Old No had written that he was to come and live with her. He'd never seen her, but she was his own great-grandmother, and that was something. Of course she would be very old. He thought of some old people he had seen who were so old that it frightened him. He wondered if she would be frighteningly old. He began to feel afraid already. And to shake it off, he thought about Green Noah and Penny Soakey. What queer names. Green Noah was pure mystery, but Penny Soakey was friendly like a joke. Suddenly the train stopped and the porters were shouting, Penny Soakey, Penny Soakey. Tosland had no sooner got the door open than a man wearing a taxi driver's hat came along calling, Anybody here for Green Noah? Are you Master Toslam for Green Noah? Oh, yes, please, it, it's me. This your luggage? Two more in the van, right. You stand here on out the rain while I get it. There were a few houses to be seen on one side of the line and on the other nothing but flooded fields with hedges standing in the water. Come along, said the taxi man. We've put all your luggage in the car. It'll be dark before we get there. And we've got to go through a lot of water. Is it deep? Well, not so deep, I hope, that we can't get through. If it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, will it be a real flood? Oh, well, sure enough it would. Tosland sat by the driver and they set off. The windscreen wipers made two clear fans on the windscreen through which he could see the road half covered with water, with ditches brimming either side. When they came near the bridge that crossed the river, the road disappeared under water altogether, and they seemed to drive into the side of the river with a great splash that flew up against the windows. But it was only a few inches deep, and then they reached the humpback bridge and went up and over it and down again into deep water. This time they drove very carefully, like bathers walking out into cold water. The car crept along, making wide ripples. We don't want to stick there here, said the driver. This car don't float. They came safely through that side too, and now the headlights were turned on, for it was growing dark and Tosland could see nothing but rain and drizzle. Is it far? he asked. Not very, but we have to go a long way round to get past the floods. Green Noah stands almost in the middle of it now, because the river runs alongside the garden. Once you get there, you won't be able to get out again till the floods go down. Well, how will I get in then? Can you swim? Yes, I did 20 strokes last summer. Will that be enough? Oh, you'll have to do better than that. Perhaps if you felt yourself sinking, you could manage a few more. But it's quite dark. How will I know where to swim to? The driver laughed. Don't you worry. Mrs Old No will never let you drown. She'll see you get there, all right. Now, here we are. At least, I can't go any further. Tosland pushed the car door open and looked out. It had stopped raining. The car was standing 
in a lane of shallow water that stretched out into the dark in the front and behind. The driver was wearing Wellington boots and he got out and paddled round the car. Tosland was afraid that he would be left now to go on as best he could by himself. He did not like to show that he was afraid, so he tried another way of finding out. If I am going to swim, he said, what will you do with my luggage? You haven't got no gum boots, have you? said the driver. Come on, get on my shoulders and we'll have a look round to see if anyone's coming to meet you. Tosland climbed onto his shoulders and they set off. But almost at once they heard the sound of oars and a lantern coming round the corner of the lane, rocking on the bows of a rowing boat. A man called out, Is that Master Tosland? The driver shouted back, Is that Mr Bogus? Tosland was speechless with relief and delight. Good evening, Master Tarslin, said Mr Bogus, holding up the lantern to look at him. While Tosland looked too, and saw a nice old cherry red face with bright blue eyes. Pleased to meet you. I knew your mother when she was your size. I bet you were wondering how you were going to get home. It was nice to hear somebody talking about home in that way. Toslin felt much happier and now he knew the driver had been teasing him so he grinned and said I was going to swim. The boat was moored to somebody's garden gate while the two men put the trunk and tuck box into it. You'll be all right now said the taxi driver. Good night to both of you. Good night and thank you said Toslin. Mr Bogus handed him the lantern and told him to kneel up in the bows with it and shout if they were likely to bump into anything. They rode around two corners in the road and then in at a big white gate. Toslin waved the lantern about and saw trees and bushes standing in the water and presently the boat was rocked by quite a strong current and the reflection of the lantern streamed away in elastic jigsaw pieces and made gold rings around the tree trunks. And at last they came to a still pool reaching to the steps of the house. And the keel of the boat grated on gravel. The windows were all lit up but it was too dark to see what kind of a house it was, only that it was a high and narrow like a tower. Come along in, said Mr Bogus. I'll show you in. We'd like to see Mrs Old Nose Face when she sees you. The entrance hall was a strange place. As they stepped in, a, a similar door opened at the far end of the house and another man and boy entered there. Then Toslin saw that it was only themselves in a big mirror. The walls round him were partly rough stone and partly plaster, but hung all over with mirrors and pictures and china. There were three big old mirrors all reflecting each other, so that at first Tosland was puzzled to find what was real and which door one could go through straight, the, one, the way one wanted to, not sideways somewhere else. He almost wondered which was really himself. There were vases everywhere filled with queer flowers, branches of dried winter twigs out of which little tassels and rosettes of flower petals were bursting. Some yellow, some white, some purple. They had an exciting smell, almost like something to eat. And they looked as if they'd been produced by magic, as if someone had said abracadabra. Let these sticks burst into life. What if my great-grandmother is a witch, he thought. Above the vases, whatever there was, was, was a beam 
or an odd corner or a doorpost out of which they could, as it were, grow. There were children carved in dark oak leaning out over the flowers. Most of them had wings. One had a real bird's nest on its head. And all of them had such round polished cheeks they seemed to be laughing and welcoming him. While he was looking round, Bogus had taken his coat and cap from him and hung them up. Your great-grandmother will be in there, he said, and led them to a little old stone doorway, such as you might find in a belfry. He knocked on the door. Come in, said a clear voice. Bogus gave Tosland a shove, and he found himself inside. the end of today's chapter. I'll see you Thursday for the next one.